Hello, and welcome to 2020 Pain Care. We have a wonderful panel for you today talking everything pain management. Our moderator, Justin Ferrari, is here with us. Of course, we are starting off with Dr. Ashish Shah from Synergex Med. He's going to be talking about treating acute pain and introduction to the topic of pain management. Then we have Dr. Michael Price with Pledge Medical. He will be talking about PRP with us today. Dr. Hassan Badai from Pacific Pain and Regenerative Medicine will be talking everything stem cells. Dr. Hal Kraft from Laser MD Pain Relief will be talking about no needle pain management treatments. And then, of course, Dr. Paul Chu from Vanguard Interventional Pain Specialists will be talking peripheral nerve and spine cord stimulator therapy. And with that, I'll give it over to Justin to start us off. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending this morning. I'm happy to have everyone, and I'm especially pleased to be amongst such great doctors from the Southern California region with a specialization in making everyone's life better and less painful. Um, you know, my goal for today is to make sure that the doctors answer all the questions from our, you know, audience. You know, it is virtual, but nonetheless, we will be taking questions from the audience. So if there's any questions you want to ask the doctor specifically, feel free to jump in. Uh, I think we're going to begin with Dr. Shah, but I'm going to ask everyone uh, after Dr. Shah's intro, we'll go around and everyone can take a few minutes to introduce themselves. So Dr. Shah, the, the floor is yours. Perfect. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So I'm Dr. Ashish Shah. And so I'm going to keep this short just so we can get to the panel part of the webinar today. So I'm an anesthesiologist and a pain doctor. So therefore, I get to take care of acute pain in many scenarios, whether it's acute pain right after a surgery or if it's pain right after a car accident. And I really enjoy taking care of acute pain because it's one of the very few fields in medicine where you get to see the results of your work instantaneously or the results in a very short period of time. The patients really truly appreciate the help you get because you can see them getting better and they really appreciate it. And a lot of these times, the patients are in excruciating pain and you get to be part of the process to help them. However, taking care of acute pain is not easy. People come in with a variety of symptoms and a variety of levels of pain and the objective findings might be the same for the two people. Imagine two patients that both have three millimeter disc herniations, but the symptoms and the pains are totally different. So we have to work with the patients and find the root cause of their pain. And not every solution works on every patient. Some will require steroids, some will require PRP, and some will just get better with physical therapy and anti-inflammatories. And a very few will require surgery. But I think in pain medicine, we're on a, the cost of a truly transformative time. The future of pain medicine is coming right before our eyes. We have now options for patients that were not available five to 10 years ago. We are shunning opioids, just like we should, and for good reason. But we also have many options that are not just the typical steroid injections. And don't get me wrong, steroids are wonderful and they can help a lot of people. But now we have many other tools in our toolkit. So today we're going to talk about some of the other tools that we have as pain doctors. And it's PRP, or platelet-rich plasma injections, stem cell injections, no needle epidurals, and spinal cord simulators. So we have four experts who are going to talk to you about each category. So I'll let the panel start with each of their sessions. Okay, um, I'm Dr. Michael Price. I'm uh, board certified in uh, orthopedic surgery and regenerative medicine. I practice uh, with Pledge Medical in Southern California. My practice is pretty much all personal injury. So just about everybody I see has been in a motor vehicle accident of some sort. The reason I mention that is um, almost every patient I see has a spinal injury in addition to some other extremity injury. And with the spinal injuries, the thing I like to talk about with the patient is that if I get a patient who has, for example, neck or back pain, and they have an MRI that shows two or three discs that may be protruding or herniated, uh, I, li I like to remind the patient, listen, you know, in order for that disc to have gotten protruding or herniated, there had to be an abnormal force at that level of the spine, which means that everything at that level of the spine got injured, not just the disc. So it was the facet joints, 
the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments. And in the vast majority of people that I see, they do not have radiculopathy. So they don't have pain shooting down their arms or legs. It's very localized. They'll Sometimes they'll point to an area that's maybe the size of a silver dollar or a small pancake. And for those people, um, I'll say, listen, you, you certainly have a disc issue. And there, there may come a point in time here where we won't have a interventional pain specialist, like a multiple number of the panelists we have today to do an epidural where they go inside the spinal canal with a small amount of steroids strategically placed. But if they don't have radiculopathy, uh, what I'll often suggest is, listen, let's try to do some PRP injections to the soft tissues around the spine at that level where you're having your pain and it's directed exactly to where the pain is. So if they point to a spot on their neck and say, it's just killing me right here, well, that's where the shot goes. Uh, so it's pretty easy to do. Uh, some people are even comfortable enough to do it awake in the office. Some people, if it's multiple levels, clearly need to be taken to the operating room and put under some MAC um, anesthesia just so they're twilighted while you're doing it. But what I've found is the use of PRP to be very helpful for that non-radiating kind of axial back or neck pain that people get, particularly from accidents. And I do want to emphasize, I'm, I'm really talking about accidents where there's been a, some kind of torquing or twisting injury. I'm not really referring to just straight up degenerative conditions where somebody had pain that developed over many years and because um, uh, they obviously that's not somebody who injured all of those soft tissue structures. So I think the key is to ask, okay, is this a traumatic etiology for the pain or is this just a long-term degenerative condition? In the long-term degenerative conditions, I'm more apt to immediately turn those over to the interventional pain specialist because often those will require intraspinal epidurals or even medial branch blocks. But in the traumatic setting, where I know there's been a large soft tissue envelope injury around that disc level that's protruding, uh, that's when I move ahead with the PRP injections. And the reality is those patients tend to get at least some relief and some get dramatic relief where they don't require going on to further deeper injections. So that's sort of the way I approach the spine when it comes to the use of PRP. When it comes to joint injuries, um, I, I've noticed and I've done PRP since about 2010, uh, somewhere north of 1,500 of them now. And what I've noticed is that um, they, PRP works well for joints that have been traumatized, but it works better for non-weight-bearing joints like shoulders, elbows, wrists. It, it seems to work much more dramatically and more long lasting in those joints. It does work in hips, knees, and ankles that are bearing weight, but I will typically tell people, hey, we're gonna do the PRP for your knee injury. You'll probably get some relief. Um, well, we'll keep an eye on it because we may have to repeat that uh, somewhere down the road. Uh, whereas in the upper extremity, which is essentially non-weight bearing, uh, rarely do they have to come back for a repeat PRP injection for those joints. Um, and of course, there are occasionally, certainly some patients who, if they have a partial rotator cuff tear in their shoulder or a meniscus tear in their knee, if I inject them with PRP, uh, occasionally they will not get better. And th those are the ones that will go on to require an arthroscopic procedure. Uh, of course, assuming they've gone through therapy and, and the like. But that's kind of how I approach the use of PRP. And just for a brief uh, comment on what PRP is, uh, we all know that to get PRP, you have the patient sit in a chair, you draw blood from them, I spin it in a centrifuge for about 10 minutes, and then I pull off the plasma. And plasma is full of factors like transforming growth factors, 
that uh, help with the production of collagen, platelet-derived growth factor, which also helps with collagen synthesis, but also epidermal growth factors and vascular endothelial growth factors, which promote angiogenesis. And one of the, there's many other things in there, but one of the other uh, properties of PRP is it is definitely not a stem cell treatment, but it does have the ability to signal stem cells that, hey, there's been something occurring at this body part. Uh, it almost mimics a new injury. So you get a little bit of heightened awareness from stem cells. And we know that from research showing that they do respond uh, to the injections of PRPs at remote sites in the body. So I'll, I'll leave the stem cell discussion to the other panelists. Uh, I didn't want to get into that, but I did want to sort of let you know what the components of PRP are that we find uh, most effective. And I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, doctor. That was an excellent presentation. And, you know, I will want to circle back with you and discuss the difference between stem cells and PRP. But I believe, as you stated, Dr. Mobin is going to go through stem cells. So maybe I can call on Dr. Mobin to go next and discuss stem cells. And then, you know, we'll save for the end for you two to discuss the benefits of each. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's my name is Dr. Badai, but uh, I do uh, I do love <laughs> Dr. Mobin too. Give him my best, but uh, I'm so embarrassed. No, that's okay. Uh, Dr. Mobin's a good friend of mine, but um, you know, I, excellent uh, discussion, uh, uh, Dr. Price and Dr. Shaw, and 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 uh, thank you guys for having me on on this panel. But uh, let me let me kind of uh, go back to a little bit about uh, our approach here and what we're trying to do. So, so my my training is in um, physiatry, which is I have a board certification in uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation, and in uh, pain medicine as well. So what, what that entails, basically, I'm in the business of improving quality of life through understanding and diagnosing uh, soft tissue injuries. Uh, and essentially, we're, we're the specialty that falls under the, the muscle, the tendon, the ligament, the connective tissue, and how it all can effectively go into like a, uh, um, a symphony of, of, of collaboration of how the, the body systems work. Now, what we do in my approach is I'm very clinical based versus uh, my colleagues who are anesthesia based, which they're very procedural based. And we're, we all come to pain management from different schools of thought and philosophies and, and our training. Um, you know, we basically look at uh, the patient from a multimodal treatment approach when I evaluate a pain patient from a clinical standpoint. So the, the beautiful thing about um, pain medicine and the physiatry approach to a patient is that uh, we'll take a complete understanding from a, uh, a clinical aspect, tie that in with a diagnostic tool aspect, and provide a, uh, a treatment plan and protocol that is very minimally invasive, multimodal, uh, therapy based, uh, but medically based at the same time with a minimal invasive approach. So, so, you know, in our, in our, in our school of thought, we're looking at it as, okay, well, how can we help provide, uh, improvement to ADLs or activities of daily living and improve functionality and therefore quality of life from an interventional standpoint that is minimally invasive to surgery. What came across was, well, I've been doing regenerative treatments for about 12 years now. I'm pretty comfortable and been kind of leading in the field in, in that aspect where it just happens to be that, well, what we know from a, uh, from a normal physiological standpoint, how the body heals itself. Everyone knows this on the panel. The body has, one of the biggest kept secrets in, in medicine is that the body tends to have the ability to heal itself without any of us doing anything if the environment and the conditions are there for itself. 
However, what we're able to do is enhance a physiological process, which is the regenerative and pro-inflammatory aspect of what uh, Dr. Price was talking about, PRP, but adding a supra-physiological approach. And that is the advent, that's what the advent of regenerative medicine is and what we've been doing. And really all the com combination of these amazing natural occurring growth factors and cells that we normally have studied from a histological standpoint, we are able to uh, maybe uh, add or, or, or take a super physiological value and add it to an area of injury, such as soft tissue injury, a nerve injury, uh, inflammatory process. And so, I mean, we'll, you know, I'll, I'll go back to it on a slide deck, but that's kind of our approach from physiatry standpoint. So, so we'll look at it from a clinical standpoint as well as uh, interventional standpoint, just like my colleagues, like Dr. Shaw and Dr. Price and uh, Dr. Kraft. But uh, that's that's kind of my side of how we approach pain management. And All right, doing Dr. Bidet, I, I, you're, you're obviously super intelligent doctor, and, and a lot of the language you're using is going to be above what general attorneys are going to be accustomed to. Sure. So in, in maybe a minute or two, tell us what does your practice do differently? And when and why should these attorneys advise their clients that they may want to come to your clinic? Okay. So in my practice, I'm an orthopedic. So how do we provide orthopedic care for personal injury? Uh, how do we provide uh, a safe non-steroidal based treatment uh, without opiates and to uh, offer treatments that are non-surgical or interventional? So we'll, we'll focus on a treatment protocol that is, we'll do, we will do our standard epidurals. Now, if patients don't have uh, benefit from that will focus on treatments such as amniotic fluid treatment, which means treatment that is that super physiological approach or PRP treatment to the spine. So, so, I, so I apologize because you're hitting a really important point and I want everyone to really make sure they understand this, which is you're, you're starting with, with the assumption that we know that we need to avoid steroids. I don't think everyone in yeah. the chat understands. So why do okay. you want to avoid steroids? Fair enough. So so uh, steroids is it is it a we're, we we we're, we're first of all let's go to the root of the problem. So if there's nerve root inflammation or there's a facet joint arthropathy or facet joint re mediated pain or if the back pain is because of the spine, the pain generators are can we control the pain symptoms through understanding a nerve root? So let's try steroid-based treatments. If a steroid-based treatment does not help control pains, then let's try a nerve block treatment that we can do that is traditional as a, as a non-steroid base. Then we can focus on treatments such as a, a PRP treatment, or a new treatment that's become recognized in the in that is accepted in the uh, in the insurances and Medicare, which is amniotic fluid treatment. So what we can do is offer advanced, state of the art treatment that is now part of our protocol and understood uh, in the in the uh, Medicare community, actually. So so we're able to we're able to do these options for patients to one, um, you know, maybe a avoid or delay surgery such as you know uh, joint surgeries um, or or spine surgery if we can avoid or or help reduce their their pain and improve their quality of life so so we would start with a traditional customary steroid treatment but uh, offer interventional non-steroid based treatments and RFAs which is something that we can burn the nerves and provide regenerative treatments, which is now becoming more of a staple understanding that we can do that and to help provide quality of life enhancements. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm going to follow up in this whole idea of avoiding steroids by going to Dr. Kraft next. And Dr. Kraft, can you tell us about your expertise and, and what your vision is for the future of medicine as it relates to spinal injuries and things of that nature? 
Sure. So, uh, and thank you for having me. Uh, just my background is I spent 20 years as an anesthesiologist, and then for the past five years, the only thing I've done is uh, treat pain with no needle epidurals, which is a fan sort of a, a marketing name for the, the medical name is laser photobiomodulation, but I just call it no needle epidurals. And no needle epidurals effectively treat almost uh, all pain, uh, inflam inflammatory pain, uh, by causing the body to release its own anti-inflammatories. Steroids that we've been talking about are external anti-inflammatories, and you can get the body um, through uh, stem cells, PRP, or no needle epidurals to release its own anti-inflammatories. So uh, it's just a different approach to treat pain, and you can use the no-needle epidural both for spinal and peripheral pain. Is it recognized by traditional health insurers? Uh, so yes, about 80% of my practice is Medicare and PPO, and 20% is uh, accidents and liens. So if I were to try to explain to my client what a no-needle epidural is and how it's distinguished from its needle sibling, how would I explain that to my client? Uh, so the simplest way is no-needle epidural is the only treatment uh, where if it's done correctly is actually pleasant. It's a very, uh, typically we use a flashlight, it's a beam about one or two inches across, and it's a very high intensity laser. Sometimes we touch the skin, sometimes we don't. And we, we treat a region rather than an epidural, which is pinpoint. Okay. And, you know, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Dr. Bidet, which is if, if, a, if one of the attorneys here has a, a patient, a client, and is trying to figure out what type of doctor this patient needs and is working with the patient and the patient is actively asking the attorney for his opinion, at what point or what should that attorney and client be looking for to know that they need to come to your office? Uh, so the, the general rule of thumb is to start with the least invasive treatment, Cairo PT, and end up in the uh, kind of a waterfall at the most invasive, which is surgery. Everybody, uh, I think everybody would agree that you, you start with least invasive, no needle is in the middle, epidural uh, is kind of two-thirds of the way down standard epidurals. Uh, the PRP stem cells involve a needle but are non-steroidal based. So it's a waterfall kind of Cairo PT, perhaps no needle or PRP or stem cell, mm -hmm. standard epidurals, then surgery as, a, as sort of a last resort. How many of your patients find success with the no needle epidural and also then what percent end up going and getting traditional epidurals in your experience uh so no needle i've first of all, i've done the most uh no, laser pain treatment no needle epidurals in the country about twenty five thousand treatments and uh roughly two-thirds will have some pain relief almost exactly the same percentage as standard epidurals uh in in my experience actually very few end up needing an epidural, probably 10%, uh, simply because sometimes pa sometimes there's a budget issue. Uh, sometimes patients come to me because they simply are totally uh, freaked out about having a needle. And even though I recommend epidurals, I, I did epidurals for 20 years, I love them. Uh, I've told all my patients that if I need one, I would get one. Um, not all patients feel uh, like that that needle is something that they can grasp or sort of deal with. Well, I can tell you, I've had four lumbar epidurals myself, so I'm no stranger to this treatment and learning about, you know, all the up and coming technology. It's, it's amazing to watch. So I, I guess we're going to transition over to Dr. Chu, which is when all else fails, you call in Dr. Chu to fix everybody's problems. So Dr. Chu, can you jump in and tell us about what your experience is? where your clients seem to be coming from and why and how you help them solve the riddle. Sure, uh, good morning everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. I am uh, a board certified anesthesia and pain management and I've been doing the personal injury cases for past that uh, four or five years now. And of course, I totally agree with all the panelists. Uh, we should start with the uh, least invasive procedures, uh, steroid uh, maybe use in uh, selected cases 
and PRP uh, stem cells should be the, the uh, sort of becoming more of the standard of use because of the uh, potential side effect with the, uh, that's involved with steroids. Uh, but what happened when everything fails? So I have a little short slide presentation for everybody to see, and uh, maybe that way uh, I can go over some of the, uh, the background of it. And then of course, uh, uh, some of the rationales and uh, the, the science behind uh, what we call peripheral nerve stimulators that could be uh, a, another tool to help patient to recover from these uh, uh, injuries. So let me share this with you guys here. So I'm going to go over uh, this. Okay, so um, I don't need to be preached to the choirs that uh, there's lots of accidents every year. Uh, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, there are about 5 million uh, motor vehicle collisions every year and uh, about 2 million of injuries. Of course, uh, unfortunately, 30,000 fatalities. Uh, and this causes pain as well. The, uh, the Lower back pain is the most common musculoskeletal uh, disability condition for an adult uh, that has a prevalence of about 84%. And of course, that uh, individual younger than 45 year old, that's the number one uh, most common uh, cause of disability. And we define chronic back pain as a chronic pain syndrome that has lasted for more than uh, 12 weeks or three months. Uh, this way past beyond is a normal healing uh, period. So mechanical lower back pain uh, is generally a result from some acute traumatic event, but also can cause by just repetitive cumulative trauma and the severity varies from just simple uh, bending, twisting, up to uh, perhaps a, a motor vehicle collision or a fall, slip and fall. As you can see, here's a model of the spine and the spine is uh, composed of, uh, the lumbar spine is of five vertebrates. Uh, the vertebrates composed of the, the bony structure, the ligaments, the joint capsule, uh, muscles, and of course, the, all the nerve in innervations. And it has to serve two purposes. One is it has to be very strong to protect our spinal cord, all the nerve roots, but at the same time it has to be flexible, uh, mobile, so that we can do our uh, routine range of motion. And the pathophysiology of this, that uh, the pain is more, very complex uh, and also uh, multifaceted because that, uh, uh, any of those elements, the bones, the ligaments, the nerves, the, the disc, uh, can all be part of, it, uh, of, of the cause of this pain. And of course, uh, between 70 to 80% of the back pain is really the, the true cause is not, not known, it's unknown. And, that, uh, and most of the pain is a, uh, again, has a mixture of uh, uh, nociceptive, which is more the soft tissue type of uh, injury, uh, and neuropathic, which is a nerve uh, irritation. So the management consists of, obviously, the goal is to control the pain, control the inflammation, restore the range of function, and that uh, the soft tissue uh, flexibility, improve the muscular strength, endurance, uh, trying to retrain some uh, the coordination of the spine, and that uh, uh, improve the general cardiovascular conditions, of course, maintain the exercise program. And as we all agree, surgical intervention should be the last resort uh, in this in treatment of the lower back pain. We can divide the back the pain in two uh, separate categories. The one that has radicular component and non-radicular component. So when we say radicular component, meaning the limbs are involved, uh, pain shooting down the, the arms or legs and that uh, with numbness, tingling, sometimes weakness and someone just stay within the, uh, the trunk, the axle part of it. And based on that, uh, the different treatments, we always uh, recommend to start with the interdisciplinary rehabilitation. So uh, physiotherapies, uh, chiropractic therapies, and uh, maybe some uh, over-the-counter or prescription strain anti-inflammatories to begin with. But when the pain is mainly predominantly axial, which means it stays in the trunk, uh, Facetio injection has been very helpful. If that uh, proves to be uh, successful, but not lasting, we proceed with the medium branch block uh, and uh, continue with the uh, radio frequency rhizotomy. And sometimes epidural injection just for uh, axial pain. When there's more of the radicular components, so the uh, pain going down the arms or legs, then uh, epidural steroid injections are probably initially what is being done. Uh, sometimes surgery, if there's a, uh, some structural uh, compression, such as stenosis, uh, slippage of the, uh, the spine, then uh, um, that may be discussed. 
And lastly, if if those things are done and that are uh, still not helpful, traditionally surgeries probably is the uh, next uh, step of treatment. So the idea to, to treat patients uh, as early as we can is to avoid uh, developing uh, into chronic pain. And the way it develops into chronic pain is basically there's an exciting factor. Uh, the nerves are sending signal to the brain to say that they're injured, there's pain. And that injury somehow become unbalanced and start to send in more where it's supposed to and causes the brain to uh, change its behavior. And now sensing even uh, normal sensations or something minimal sensation to become uh, very painful. And the idea is break that cycle uh, to, mit to prevent that first from developing and, uh, uh, and change all that. So traditionally we said medication, physiotherapy, if that doesn't work, injections. If that doesn't work, ablations. That doesn't work, of course, surgery. And if the surgery didn't work, we consider spinal cord stimulator uh, implant to help. Uh, but what if uh, the patient had done all those? So you tried all the medication, tried all the injections, even some surgery or some patient, unfortunately, they're not surgery candidate or some patient that uh, you can't really find any significant pathology at this bulge of one millimeter. Uh, everything else seems to be normal. Uh, or someone just flat up this, this side said, you know, I don't want to have surgery because I heard so many terrible things about surgery, what to do. So for those patients, I think uh, now we have other options. We think that about 80% of the lower back pain patient suffers from a muscle uh, that's highlighted here, that's called the multifidus muscles. Uh, they have atrophy on those things. And that, uh, uh, and as we said, 70, 80% of those uh, patients uh, patient with lower back pain are uh, of unknown, non-specific cause, then it's possible that, uh, that this back pain, the non-specific cause is because of the centralization of it, because of the continuous uh, sending the signal to the brain. And what if we uh, can help to improve the atrophy of those uh, multifidal muscles, reduce the centralization, and therefore uh, improve the pain? The way how this motif of the muscles work is that if there is a uh, soft tissue injury that's not neural, they can cause uh, decreased signal distance to those uh, to the muscles, and that creates instability to the joint. And the facet joint itself, of course, due to overload, can continue to create uh, additional damage, and then there's a vicious cycle that goes on uh, to perpetuate into the chronic pain. So the idea is that uh, if we can improve the signals, uh, prevent sens sensitization, avoid the maladaptive cortical changes, therefore we can ch uh, stop the, uh, the chronic pain and of course restore uh, those uh, uh, normal physical uh, activities. And the, the no ar new algorithm usually that we try to do is that the first three months of therapy, conservative treatment, if that, doesn't work, then we start talking about interventional pain uh, treatments, uh, including epidural injections and whatnot. And somewhere along that, before the surgery, is will be the neuromodulation, which is uh, to try to modulate the change of, uh, uh, prevent the changes. And there is also uh, quite a bit of uh, supporting literatures about the use of uh, peripheral nerve stimulator now for the lower back pain. Basically, if we stimulate those nerves for about a month, once we remove those the temporary peripheral nerves, uh, the stimulators, the relief continues to up to a, a year, sometimes up to two years in the most recent studies. Uh, and that is what we can offer to our patients. And most patients are very happy to, under, to have other options because what if uh, when we talk about new uh, radiation, uh, radio frequency ablation, which does not spare the muscle because by uh, ablating the nerve, the multiple muscles will uh, continue to atrophy and that, uh, and that could continue to perpetrate some of the, uh, the uh, maladaptive changes versus the conventional neuromodulator where it, does, it doesn't it uh, does spare those, uh, uh, the muscles, but requires a big surgery. It's an implant uh, of a device that maybe patients are averse to. So that uh, peripheral nerve stimulator seems to uh, cover both of the issues uh, much more favorably. And if you ask uh, about 452 patients about uh, the options of uh, a permanent stimulator implant, a permanent peripheral nerve stimulator implant, a 
uh, temporary peripheral nerve stimulator implant or a radio frequency uh, therapy, probably majority of it will like to stay with the radio frequency and the uh, temporary peripheral nerve stimulator implant. Uh, but if you talk more about the uh, outcome of it, most people at the end will prefer the uh, peripheral nerve stimulator implant versus any of uh, the other options. So uh, the new algorithm that we think that is gonna help the patient is between the ablation and the uh, injection is stands that uh, the peripheral nerve stimulator so that we can uh, control some of those pain that is not necessarily uh, amenable to those uh, early injections and does not require immediate ablation of those nerves because we wanna preserve the neural structure, we wanna preserve the muscular uh, chair on in the spine to maintain the stability uh, of the uh, of the spine. So, uh, but peripheral nerve stimulator is not only uh, limited to the back. Anything, chronic shoulder pain, knee pain, uh, chest wall pain for due to rib fractures, uh, foot pain, ankle pain, uh, any basically any identifiable nerve pain that uh, has no. Uh, obvious treatable options, this could be a very uh, viable uh, solution for their uh, pain conditions. So having said that then, of course, uh, we do all, all those above, and just this is another one of our tools to be able to help the patient when everything else fail and the patient is not necessarily ready or want to have surgery. Uh, and then I return the floor to Justin. All right, Dr. Chu. So I, I'm going to ask you the same question I've asked everybody else, which is, at what point, if our client is actively asking for the attorney's advice, right, at what point should we advise them to see you? At what point do we give them your information and say, look, you know, if you, if you want another opinion, we, you know, I, I've met this doctor, I, I've, I've sat in on a session of this doctor speaking and teaching us. Obviously, you sound very informed and very well researched. When do we send a, a patient to you? Usually, our practice sees patient towards the middle of their uh, initial chiropractic treatment. But we've seen patients from all spectrum: the patient who just had a, uh, had an accident uh, two days ago versus patient who has been through the different cares for years. So I think uh, usually after about twelve weeks of a conservative treatment, if the pain is still uh, not satisfactory or slightly before 12 weeks time is a good time for us to, to evaluate the patient. Okay. And does your office do any of the injections that some of these offices do? Absolutely. We, we provide all those injections that, uh, that, that, that the panelists provide. So epidural injections, facet injections, whether we steroid, non-steroid or PRP, uh, all those things are as part of our uh, tools that, that, that we offer to patients. Okay. Um, so then I, I guess, you know, kind of going back to the intro question I had for you is, what do you see failing and where do you see the success in the, the stimulators and, and what different options do we have in terms of stimulators? Well, uh, I think... The stimulator is certainly not for everybody just walk through the door and say, this is for you. A stimulator is just one of the tools that we have in order to uh, help patient better. And it's just uh, solving a puzzle. We try to figure out where the, the cause of the pain is and we try to target that. And unfortunately, as we mentioned, about 70 to 80% of the causes are, un are unspecific. Then uh, we can always use this. And most of the time, the stimulator therapy because we don't have a, uh, a crystal ball to, to see what's going to happen, there's a trial period. So this is not basically a non-committal uh, type of a therapy that we you try it for a certain period of time before you say it helped or not, uh, that will commit to a, a longer long-term therapy. So for patients, uh, peripheral nerve stimulator is very uh, non-invasive or minimal invasive and uh, well tolerated. Uh, so I will say that anybody who has not had a good uh, relief from facet joint ingestion, medium branch block, uh, or had those, but this, uh, uh, did not, uh, do not want to have any uh, ablation done, the rhizotomy, uh, stimulator is definitely a, a very good option for those people. And what is, what is the procedure like? 
Procedures uh, is very simple. Could be done under fluoroscopic guidance, which is X-ray, or uh, just ultrasound guidance. Basically, uh, for the lower back, uh, we identified that uh, the spinal process, and then just uh, two wires inserted directly perpendicular to the spine, and that that's it. And then connect to to a little external uh, receiver that uh, that will send stimulation impulse to the patient, uh, so they will try the the, the therapy. And then what's removal like? Removal is just like taking off a, a piece of uh, IV or something. So if you you had an injection before, they've done IV for you, it just removed the IV. It's very simple. It's nothing. No, no it's done in the office. Very, very, very uh, painless, basically. Okay. Pain and how long do you expect that these modulars should be installed in the people? So uh, if we talk about peripheral, the temporary peripheral nerve stimulators, is just, it's a 60 day therapy. If a uh, patient after 60 days do not uh, find that's very helpful, but with, upon removal, they find that the pain is returning, then we can discuss a permanent implant. And that permanent implant uh, will remain in the body uh, for the duration of the battery, which may last anywhere between seven years to 15 years. And okay. now, actually, there are newer technology now that that's, that's not required to implant the battery uh, and then just lasts for as long as the, the device, uh, uh, you know, the patient's uh, lifespan, basically. It also yeah, looks like we have a question for uh, Dr. Badai. This was asked a little bit ago. Um, they ask if you can briefly explain in stem cell procedures from prepaid stored umbilical stem cell in bank to its usage. So how does yeah, that yeah, so, work? So very interesting, right? So, so in, in the concept of, of using a banked stored stem cell uh, versus uh, a, a new fresh cord blood that is commercially uh, from, from tissue options, um, we, we find that it's, it's usable if someone has their own stem cells and they want to use it in, in our facility. However, I mean, essentially, you know, getting it from uh, some, some entities that currently have stem cells available, you know, it's, it's really, there's a specific, you know, good manufacturing process and uh, the regulations are, are very tight um, uh, approached in terms of, you know, companies that we use locally here in, in United States, California, and we, we basically will use, um, you know, these, the, like, for example, a third party uh, tissue bank, like uh, Invitrix Biologics, as an example, and they can bring product to the, to the clinic and to the offices and use those. Uh, but basically, it's simply available versus using someone's own stored cord blood, uh, which we can use, but it might be more expensive, you know, from the store uh, sort of process. So, so we'll, we'll partner up with a third party uh, company and and uh, provide stem cells which are completely safe allergenic sources and and uh, do targeted tissue treatments um, stem cells but right now what's become very popular is the acellular uh, allogenic um, amniotic tissue treatments which is uh, becoming more and more recognized as a um, insurance approved uh, uh, care for for our patients with soft tissue inflammation and and uh, pain. So so been using a lot of that and and um, had not. It's been very uh, cost effective, um, and you know we're we're able to do that. Um, but but you know these are these are treatments that that. Uh, are very safe has been studied has been you know we've been doing treatments for for years and um it's been effective in in um you know getting patients uh inflammation and pain under control now i don't want to you know bring out my slide deck and talk about um talk about the the process but i mean if everyone's interested i have my slide deck that i can you know introduce um to the panel and um you guys can see it, but but it's pretty pretty comprehensive on the mechanism of of how stem cells work. But um, you know, we'll we'll we can save that for another time. But, All right. Uh, so I, I have a I have two major questions. So I'm going to start with the first one. I kind of open it up to the panel. Uh, 
what success have we seen using PRP or stem cell being injected into either the epidural space or the facet? I, I specifically uh, don't use it for the epidural space. I have had fantastic responses for the facet joint capsule inflammation. Um, I use it primarily in the facet joint arthritic changes. So someone comes to me with axial neck or lower back pain, I've, I've realized um, the, the, the added advantage of going in with a nerve block first and then finding that the diagnosis of facet related pain has been established through that injection, then we'll go in aggressively with amniotic fluid or stem cell or PRP for facet joint mediated pain. And then I'll follow that up with an RFA um, and, and, um, and get a really good uh, response out of that. So predominantly it's been really effective in pain and functional improvement and medication uh, reduction for the facet related aspect of it. I don't Dr. know what- Dr. Price, any of it? Yeah, uh, I, I would say, and I wanted to reference Dr. Chu's lecture he brought up an, a, a very important point that I cannot overemphasize, which is the multifidus muscle directly correlates with the health of the spine and pain levels. So in other words, anything you can do to plump up or strengthen the multifidus or the other paraspinal muscles around it is going to decrease back pain. And, that, and, and that's predominantly why I would say, I think it's, pretty well considered that the standard of care is if you're going to use steroid, that's, that's certainly fine for intraspinal in the epidural space. And really that's the standard of care, but anything outside of the spinal canal uh, where the multifidus or the other paraspinals are located, if you can get PRP or some form of stem cells, whether it be the patient's own cells or banked cells or stimulator, you know, that's very, very critical in helping restore the strength of those small muscles because they have a huge effect on the patient's pain level. So that's kind of my general comment about inside the spine and then outside the spine with steroids. So what's your opinion on cortisone injections? Well, I think they certainly have a place uh, for epidurals. You know, the cortisone or steroid is still standard of care. Uh, but when you talk about the facet joints, um, you can now use PRP or steroid, and that's still considered either one of those is okay. But once you get outside into the muscle, uh, which is, as we referenced earlier, is also injured during these accidents, then you really need to start considering using a, something that stimulates that muscle to maintain its strength and maybe even improve strength being PRP, stem cells or st uh, neurostimulation. So would you advise for trigger point injections or some alternative? Well, I, I still think trigger point injections have their place. Um, trigger points tend to be a little bit more superficial than we're talking about. Uh, that's kind of uh, more the superficial muscle layers. But when you get down to those muscles right around the spine, those are a little bit deeper. Um, so that would usually require some kind of imaging like uh, ultrasound or the use of C-arm, whereas trigger point injections, generally, you don't necessarily have to have any imaging for that. Okay. Dr. Sh uh, Dr. Shah, do you have any, any comments on that? Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Shah. Yeah, there yeah no. So I totally agree. I think... Um, you know, in the spinal cord, or the epidurals, cortisone is still the standard of care, like Dr. Price said. And, you know, what we've seen is PRP in the facet joint, just like the other doctors have been saying, have been really, you know, beneficial. And then as you go um, superficial, it's, you know, like trigger points or in the muscles, the PRP really helps with those situations. And, you know, one thing you ask, you know, everyone is, where do you, when does an attorney decide to send a patient to, um, a pain doctor. And I think, you know, as everyone has said, we see all spectrums of pain. So I think, you know, in our practice, we tend to be very academic. So we, me and my partner both come from academic backgrounds. So we like to spend time with the patients and educate them on what's going on and what's the right thing to do and why. So even if you send them right after the accident, two days after the accident, we'll tell them, hey, you know, usually typically these 
accidents or pain goes away in four to six weeks. That's why we have this period called conservative treatment. And we want you to go to a chiropractor or physical therapist and take the anti-inflammatories. So we can be that process of educating the, uh, the patient and you know taking care of where do they need to be in their care, getting the MRIs and why they need MRIs. So we, we, you know, we tend to be very academic in our practice where you know, me and my partner both started this practice a few months back and we both work for other you know, uh, practices that fill up their schedule with 30 to 50 or sometimes 60 patients a day and they don't get any, the patient has no idea what's going on. So I think our practice, we want to be very academic as possible and spend the time and educate the patient. So in the spectrum, send them whenever um, they, you know, you feel like it's appropriate because we can help them guide from the beginning. Or if it's, you know, after chiropractic care has failed, they've seen a surgeon and they're scared of the surgery, we can still help them and educate them in that process. And yeah. Justin, do we have any more last comments for the panel before we wrap this up? Uh, I, you know, I, I have one that, that I've seen many young attorneys grapple with. And it, it's kind of twofold. Number one is how can the client be prepared in their, their time visiting you to give you a full rundown of their complaints so you can properly diagnose their issue? I mean, I think, I think, um, I think I just want to piggyback on what Dr. Shaw was saying. I think he, it's absolutely right that spend quality time with the patient to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, educate them early on and, and maybe uh, the, uh, the, the panel and the attorneys, uh, to know that they can come see, you know, medical first and then kind of quarterback the entire process. And as they go to conservative treatments and therapy and then Cairo and, and, and surgery, just kind of handhold them and let them know that this is like this. Um, to answer your question, I think, I think having um, them have established, you know, um, maybe get our, their medical questionnaire ahead of time. So they kind of understand what uh, the kind of things we'll be looking for ahead of time to kind of organize their um, thoughts as we as we see them in the in the office setting. You know, ahead of time, maybe have our intake forms in front of them. Uh, uh, advantages of communicating with the case managers and and everyone in the office about how we kind of see patients and what to look out for and how to kind of pre prime the patient or the the client before they come to our office what to you know, know what, the, you know, the doctors are going to be asking or looking for um, ahead of time is kind of uh, really important, I think. Awesome. I, I want to thank everyone so much for your time. This has been a very educational panel. Uh, th there's so much wisdom amongst all of you and tens of years of experience, if not close to 100 years of experience between this panel. It's been awesome. And it's been my pleasure hosting. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you, Justin, for moderating for us and all of our wonderful panelists. And if you want any of the contact information or CVs or presentations shown today, go ahead and email events.dm, D as in Dan, M as in Mark, at injuryinstitute.com. We'll be able to send those over to you too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Take care. Right, Bye. Go on. Bye.